join Forum IS Academy, trusted by hundreds of toppers, including IS Rank 1 Shruti Sharma. Hi, my name is Krishnan. I'll be doing the Hindu news analysis for the day. These are the five articles to be discussed and towards the end we'll see previous year questions. So let us move on to the first article. The first article is about sedition. Why? Because why is it in news? Because the law commission has recommended that sedition be retained. Now let us see what are the problems with retaining sedition. So why is this in news? Because the 279th law commission report it has laid down the grounds for retaining sedition. So they are telling continue with sedition. So they have made three significant re recommendations. Now let us see what they are. What is the first? The first is section 124A of the Indian Penal Code. That is, this is the 124A is the law of sedition. So they are telling you amend this to incorporate the meaning of sedition, which was laid down by the Supreme Court. So Supreme Court in 1962 said sedition means so 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 and so like that they told so. The law commission is telling whatever the Supreme Court told in the Kedar Nath Singh was a state of Bihar. So just remember this, this is a very important case, Kedar Nath Singh was a state of Bihar. In the Supreme Court said everything is not uh, sedition, only if certain things happen it is sedition. So what uh, law commission is telling, only if uh, I mean law commission is telling whatever the Supreme Court, Supreme Court has said in the Kedar Nath Singh case you incorporate it. Next what they are telling? Minimum sentence should be increased to sub 3 to 7 years. So, this is a bit, uh, uh, I think they are going a bit overboard with this. Third, what they are telling whenever uh, whenever you are filing FIR with respect to a sedition case, a police officer holding the rank of an, of an inspector or someone higher than him should conduct a preliminary inquiry. So, these three conditions they are telling should be done before filing a sedition case. Now, there is something called as the tendency jurisprudence. So, what the law commission has done, it has added the word tendency to incite violence. Next, what they are telling, this is, the authors are arguing that this is deflecting the attention to ambit of criminality rather than focusing on the source of criminality. So, so what the authors are telling, in spite of all these things, the amendment will not fundamentally alter the meaning of uh, sedition. Because what is sedition? Sedition is the offence of inciting hatred, contempt and dissatisfaction against the government. So what is sedition? Offence of inciting hatred, contempt and dissatisfaction against the government. So what they are telling, the new, new what is the new uh, definition that uh, law commission is giving? They are telling tendency to incite violence. So the, there is not much difference between these two things. So what is the source of crime they are telling? The source of crime is political speech against the representative government in a democracy. So the commission says not everything will be punished, only those forms of expressions that is those forms of speeches will be penalized which have a tendency to incite violence. So tendency means what is the tendency? It, its ambit is huge, right? So what the, the law commission has? The law commission has complicated the ma matters more because they are telling earlier what was the what was the benchmark? Mere inclination to incite violence rather than proof of actual violence or imminent threat to violence. This was there earlier. But now what they have done? They have added the word tendency. So this is, uh, this is in legal parlance, this is making things much more complicated. So this recommendation, what it is doing? It is taking us back to the problem that was sought to be remedied by re repealing this sedition. So people are asking for what? They are asking to repeal the sedition itself. But what law commission is doing? It is complicating the mat matters much more. So, so that is why activists are telling repeal this act altogether. So now this tendency, this word is there, no tendency. They are telling this is a loose formulation. So which allows for those expressions to be brought within the ambit of law. So they are telling this is a loose formulation. So anything can be construed as a tendency, right? So they are telling anything can be a tendency to incite violence and they will have no direct connection to public disorder or uh, uh, law and order problem. Even if those things are there, 
so even if those even if uh, someone gives a speech and uh, there is no public disorder this, they can the law enforcement can use the word tendency and they can arrest people so that is why the authors here are telling the tendency juris, juris, jurisprudence is an ambiguous standard for any judicial and executive mind so they are telling this is very ambiguous ambiguous means not clear uh, what i may think as a tendency to incite violence might differ from someone else so that is why there are nine petitions pending before the supreme court and all these are filed by people who are arrested under uh, sedition law so who are these people they are journalists former uh, uh, civil service officials all those people next what is the role of police here after nearly 2 years of back and forth between the judiciary and executive uh, in debating the validity of the law what has the commission has done the only addition is that they are telling the police should conduct a preliminary inquiry before that they can just like that arrest but now the commission is telling police should conduct a preliminary inquiry so what has happened now now there is even more ambiguous standard against which the police have to now judge a particular act so the police has to judge whether this is inclination to violation violence or not so the police are at a much more uh, uh, problematic situation because uh, they'll have to think or they'll have to interpret because it is very ambiguous uh, they'll have to judge whether a particular act a particular expression is a, is an inclusion is an inclination to is a call for violence or not so they are telling this will be very problematic because uh, you know let's say uh, if someone is celebrating the victory of a pakistani team or if someone is wa- wearing the pakistani jersey and if that is will the police tell this is a tendency to incite violence so that is a problem right so what the author is telling it paves way for further police power so so those who have uh, local state and national political power if they don't like uh, someone doing all this they'll pressurize police to arrest them so they are telling this will this will uh, this is a problem for citizens only next what they are telling so the commission has uh, decided to retain uh, retain the sedition law so uh, for the police officer it is very difficult so now there are there are other people who are telling uh, this uh, sedition law now is not misused much and even if if there are uh, misuses this can be remedied via procedural reform so like that they are telling but that is not true but uh, see even if there is a misuse of case if one once one is arrested under sedition case what will happen you will be labeled a traitor you will be tra- labeled a traitor against the nation and this is a stigma and uh, a label that you should always live with so and then what will happen he has to face a pre trial in that what will happen f- you will not uh, you will not be given bail you will go to prison you will have uh, lengthy trials and in the trials what will happen you will definitely be put in prison you will not be freed and you will have to face punishment that has a lot of uh, repercussions and next what the commission is telling like activists are telling see in foreign countries in democracies there, there is no sedition at all for that uh, law commission is telling you look at ground realities ground reality of india is different than ground reality of other country like that they are telling but what the activists are telling in fact it is the commission that is turning a blind eye to the ground realities in india because uh, because what they are telling see there are 174 cases of sedition filed against uh, 950 individuals and what did they do uh, they were just watching a video or dancing for a song so so far 174 cases of 950 individuals for just criticizing the government or for watching a video or for dancing to a two songs so they have done only these things so where did we get all this data from this comes from a, a report at decade of darkness it is a study done by a, done by an organization called article 14 so they have documented all the case of seditions filed since 2010 so next what the commission tells see just because uh, sedition case is colonial you should not uh, reject it because see even civil services com- even civil services is coming from colonial system only police system is coming from colonial system only you are not uh, rejecting that no so so commission is telling don't reject uh, uh, sedition also but uh, what they are tell- what they don't know is this this colonial system of uh, sedition 
is a political system that that has domination violence and inequality so the sedition law no what it does it creates a relationship of suppression between rulers and people rulers and citizens and uh, once sedition is there what will happen there will not be accountability there will no there will be no right to question the people in power so finally what they are telling uh, this linguistic change this procedural procedural reform and all you don't do you scrap section 124a you you be done away with sedition this is what they are telling uh, you just don't change the procedure don't change the words and all in a post colonial democracy you just don't have sedition itself like that the authors are arguing i hope you were able to understand this now let us move on to the next article this article is about what is happening between india and canada's bilateral relationship so why is this in news because uh, there was a pro kalistani parade what is pro kalistani who are kalistanis kalistanis are people who are asking for a separate kalistan what is separate kalistan it is the present state of punjab so in brampton canada what did these people do they had a tableau and in that uh, a lady was a lady in white sari was shown uh, with uh, with blood on her sari and two soldiers were showing their guns on her and there there was a board behind her which read revenge of attack on shri darbar sahib and uh, th- it was written on the side of the float never forget 1984 so we all know for sure that this is nothing but it is the depiction of assassination of prime minister our former prime minister indira gandhi and who was she assassinated by she was assassinated by her own bodyguards so this was a very dis- distasteful thing to do that is uh, what kind of people would celebrate killing of uh, killing of another human being that to a national leader so kalistanis had uh, done this in brampton canada and what was the indian response to it so he said uh, the indian response uh, was given by our external affairs minister s jay shankar and uh, he said uh, he said this was egregious what is egregious egregious means outstandingly bad this is very bad like that he said but uh, he focused on a very important thing he is telling see leave aside all these tableaus and all you see what canada is doing canada is giving space to separatists extremists and people who advocate violence will uh, will a mature democracy do all these things so he is telling this is not good for the relationship between india and canada and this is not good for canada at all why would this, why would a country support terrorist people who incite violence so so finally uh, jay shankar uh, our external minister jay shankar touched about canada's hypocritical approach so on one on one end canada talks about human rights issues and all those things and on another it supports killers and assassins and see it is not worried about india's territorial integrity why it is not worried about the territorial integrity because kalistanis are telling punjab is not a part of india they want a diff- separate country so this is against the territorial in- integrity of india and canada is doing it so so they are telling this is canada's hypocrisy but uh, our uh, external minister being a seasoned diplomat that he is he did not take the name of indira gandhi so that is what uh, extremist want right so he did not uh, name her so what people generally feel so jay shankar our external minister is coming uh, external minister is coming from another party and even for political reason he did not uh, name her that is he maintained dignity even if she is from another party uh he consider her as a national leader and uh, did what was right so so this is actually very good because what he could have done he could have uh, uh, talked about uh, uh you know anti sikh riots and all those things but he said but he had a very diplomatic approach but what uh, this canadian high commissioner to india cameron mckay did is uh he in a tweet he put uh, indira gandhi's name uh, even though he said this is not a a very right thing to do but uh, he took the name of our prime minister indira gandhi so that is also very distasteful that is not trace so in this we should see what is the role of diaspora and foreign policy so that is very important because this is a part of the syllabus right so what is happening in canada so ethnic indian community that mainly the six play an important role in canada's public life 
you all know that right so sikhs are a sikhs are integral part of canada's public life and even in uh, justin trudeau's cabinet there are a lot of ethnic indians and uh, what our external minister says is why why canada is uh, promoting khalistani elements because of vote bank politics because if uh, khalistani elements are supported the lot of pro khalistanis in canada and they will vote for trudeau so that is why he is doing all this so that is why for this vote bank only what trudeau did a few years back during the farmers agitation trudeau talked for farmers and against indian government so this is a, this is a very wrong thing to do because there are a lot of domestic issues going on in other countries but uh, other leaders don't comment on it but uh, trudeau did it so this this farmers agitation was a domestic issue and trudeau what trudeau has to comment about it so he is doing all this for the kalistani vote bank only so uh, so obviously india did not like it so he, india said this was unacceptable so uh, so what we should ponder about is we should uh, think and uh, see uh, what is india's political class approach towards diaspora because the indian diaspora in other country has become very political politically powerful it has become financially powerful and uh, professional success is also there for these people so they have become very important for india's political class now they have become a pillar of india's foreign policy uh, in fact uh, what the present government do- does is it is using our prime minister popularity with diaspora to impress domestic opinion so whenever our prime minister goes to other countries there are lot of diaspora people coming to visit him and they are using this to boost this domestic opinion and uh, other other leaders are using our prime minister's popularity for their political purpose so recently australian prime minister anthony albanese what he did australia for australia election there are a lot of ethnic indians who are going to vote so he went along with our prime minister so that he thought uh, these ethnic indians will vote for him so same thing is uh, happening everywhere so that is why the congress congress leader rahul gandhi also visited united states so earlier what happened was indian domestic politics was not taken to other countries but now it is going beyond show so it is happening in other countries also so next in the what happened in the media briefing uh, jay shankar condemned the remarks of jody thomas who is canada's national security and intelligence advisor so uh, why he condemned her because he, she said something like foreign intervention is there and economic uh, security problems are there because there are a lot of state actors and non state proxy proxies so she is telling there is foreign intervention from russia iran and india and she is telling china is also disturbing canada so she is telling india is disturbing uh, canada so for that mr jay shankar said ulta chor kotwal ko date which means how can which means the chief is calling the police because canada is only doing all those things so why is she doing all this uh, because uh, what happened indian diplomat uh, went and interacted with indian diaspora that for that she is simply telling india is seeking to influence canadian domestic affairs like that she is telling so wh- why was the indian diplomat there he was there to show the harmful impact this is this will uh, create on the bilateral ties because uh, canadian canadian politicians are separating supporting separatism in india so this will affect uh, bilateral ties right so the the diplomat was there to address these things only so for these things and all you cannot tell uh, see uh, india is interfering in canada's internal affairs so next we'll see why is trudeau doing all this because uh, trudeau is dependent on there's a party called new democratic party and uh, the leader of uh, ndp is jagmeet jagmeet singh is a khalistani sympra- sympathizer so he is asking trudeau to intervene in whatever is happening in punjab and uh, so there is radical preacher called amrit pal singh right even whatever he is doing uh, this jagmeet singh is asking trudeau to support him so this person is a canadian government ally and he is doing all these things so this is not acceptable to this india finds it totally unacceptable so finally the author says bilateral ties are going through difficult times but uh, in other areas there is uh, cooperation so one thing is the cannabis medicine project so what is this cannabis medicine project india and canada are jointly working on finding uh, rare medicines for cancer and a lot of uh, rare diseases right so for that using cannabis they are going to find medicine so india and canada is working on those projects so those things are also going on on the other hand uh, bilateral ties is also getting hit because of canada supporting separatism separatism in india 
so this is what this article is about now let us move on to the next article this article is about indian economy and how the government is battling inflation and in this you will know about a term called disinflation now let us move on to the article so what the reserve bank of india governor is telling the 4% inflation target so inflation the government wants to maintain inflation at 4% this will be met over the medium term so immediately this is not going to happen this will take some time some medium time will take so what is telling so disinflation process in india will be slow and protracted that is it will take some time so what is disinflation we'll see so what the governor is telling whatever monetary policy actions that they took in the last one year is is it is not uh, materialized yet fully so it will take some time is telling give us some time we have taken some good good decisions so disinflation will happen but just give us some time so next is telling even though our uh, inflation projection uh, uh, even though it uh, inflation even though our uh, disinflation it will take some time but inflation rate n- right now is very low only it is telling it is low at 5.1% but still it is about target only what is the target 4% is the target but is 5% 5.1 is telling this is also not very high this is lower only but in the medium term this will become 4% like 4% like that is telling so what you should know is uh, the rbi is monetary policy committee who is the head of this monetary policy committee it is the rbi governor so what is the role of the monetary policy committee it should bring down inflation to 4% over the medium term and uh, they should hold it between 2% and 6% over the long term so 4% is the medium term so plus or minus 2 it should hover between these two only it should not go above or below this so what is india's annual retail uh, inflation so from 4.7 in april it has come down to 4.25 so inflation has come down so finally uh, what is telling we our assessment is that in this inflation is going to be slow and protracted and when will it uh, converge with inflation at 4% over the medium term this uh, this inflation will be at 4% so we we would like to maintain inflation at 4% like that the governor is telling so just have a look at this uh, look at this diagram you will understand what is what is inflation if the prices increase it is inflation what is disinflation prices are decreasing that is disinflation what is deflation if prices go to negative levels that is deflation so remember the difference between disinflation and deflation disinflation is prices are coming down but they are not hitting negative negative uh, range in deflation prices are hitting the negative range next what uh, next what the governor is telling is telling regulators that is the rbi cannot be oblivious to growth so what is telling is we cannot uh, be very strong, very strict about uh, uh, growth because we should allow inflation to happen right only if inflation is there growth will be there so what is telling see a uh, lot of uh, addition to the workforce is happening every year because of uh, demographic dividend and there is obviously growth so if, if there is growth there is there is going to be inflation so is telling we'll have to be we'll have to manage all these things so next what is telling uh, in april there was a pass in uh, rbi pass in rate so this is telling don't mind all those things so finally what is telling our approach to see is telling what our approach is we want stability of the indian financial system so for that only we are having monetary policy so we don't want financial inst- instabilities because this will undermine economic growth and and this will lead to a problem in monetary policy transmission so is telling we are we are looking into all these things but growth is also inflation is we want to rein in on inflation we want to control inflation but at the same time we are not very oblivious to growth we want the country to grow also so we are following a balanced approach like that the rbi governor is telling so in this slide we we'll see what is uh, monetary policy committee so it was constituted by the central government and who is the head of it it is our it is the governor of rbi so what it does it uh, the benchmark policy interest rate repo rate so they will fix it so with that what will happen inflation will be within particular target level so initially interest rates were uh, taken by the governor alone uh, but uh, with the establishment of mpc 
what is happening so more accountability is coming in fixing the monetary policy in monetary policy what they will fix they will fix the repo rate so this committee it conducts meetings at least four times a year and uh, the whatever they discussed in the meeting it is published uh, after every meeting with each member explaining their opinion so how did the co uh, committee come about urjit patel he was the former rbi governor he uh, proposed the idea of formation of a monetary policy committee so how was it constituted it was constituted as per section 445 zb under rbi act of 1934 so rbi act of 1934 so when was the first meeting in 2016 in mumbai so it determines the policy interest rate required to achieve the inflation target it is required to meet at least four times in a year so there are totally six members and at least four members are required to be present so each member has one vote and uh, whenever there is an equality of vote the governor has a second or casting vote and uh, every once in every 6 months rbi publishes monetary policy report and in that it explains the sources of inflation and what uh, what forecast they have for the next 6 to 18 months so in this article you knew about disinflation you know what uh, you knew what the monetary policy committee is and the nitty gritties of monetary policy committee so this is what this article is about now let us move on to the next article in this article the home minister has asked states to prepare disaster management plan so what is it so why is he asking this disaster management plan that management plan so in seven sites new nuclear in installations are going to become operational so where are they going to come they going to come in karnataka haryana madhya pradesh rajasthan and uh, in kaiga chutka gorakhpur so in all these places nuclear installations are going to come so what is told he is told the states to prepare a road map in collaboration with ndma so the authority has visited seven sites and uh, strict protocols have been issued to the states for uh, rescuing people in case of any emergency so next uh, it chaired a meeting on disaster management with state ministers and uh, three major schemes have been announced, announced for disaster management at uh, rupees 8000 crore so just have a look at this map this is the seismic uh, zone so see this there is no zone 1 it starts from zone 2 so these parts of the country are zone 2 it is based on earthquake vulnerability so 59% of the indian land area is liable for liable to earthquake seismic hazard is there so have a look at this uh, map next what uh, the minister has then 5000 crore project has been allocated to expand and modernize fire services and 2500 crore project for seven most populous metro so what are they mumbai chennai bangalore kolkata hyderabad ahmedabad and pune so why is done that uh, to reduce the risk of urban flooding so in all all cities this is there urban flooding is there and uh, 825 crore landslide risk mitigation scheme so you know himalayas western gai western ghats they are prone to landslide so 825 crores have been spent have been set aside for landslide mitigation and workshops for 23 states on how to overcome hot weather conditions and uh, some states told we should give compensation to farm farmers and the central government said it will look into it so what the minister said what the finance, home minister said he said states should also increase their budget budgetary provisions for disaster management next uh, it was found that uh, preparation of district disaster management plans in 87 districts of 87 eight states was still pending and it was told that they should complete all this at the earliest so this is a very small article so this is what you should know from this now let us move on to the next topic this topic is about how G7 leaders are managing artificial intelligence. So why is this in news? Because G7 summit hosted by Japan uh, took place in Hiroshima. So what happened? They initiated something called as Hiroshima AI process (HAP). So what they have done is they are determining a way to go forward and regulate artificial intelligence. So what they want? They want responsible AI and global AI governance. so they want human centric and trustworthy ai based on oecd ai principles what is oecd organization of economic countries so that is oecd and uh, they want to maximize the benefits brought by artificial intelligence 
so g7 countries are using uh, forum fora like this to deliberate a regulation so what they but sometimes what they are doing even if they are doing for, for forum or international meetings like this they are acting on their own inst- and they are not waiting for outcomes from forums like this so there is uh, people are coming together but at the same time what is happening countries are preferring to go their own way so this is also happening so in this slide we'll see what is this hiroshima ai process all about so so th- this is the forum where uh, ai has got the most importance so because the see even G- g7 leaders are very engaged with things like ukraine economic sip- security issues supply chain disturb disruptions nuclear disarmament all these things are going on but see in this time they are giving importance to ai so this shows how important important artificial intelligence is so what do they want to do here they want to advance international discussions uh, they want to make ai inclusive and they want interoperability so and finally they want to achieve the goal of trustworthy artificial intelligence so this should be in line with democratic value so in the g7 communique they said uh, they are going oecd and global partnership on ai so they are going to come together and conduct practical projects so they want uh, g7 all the working group to come together and work in an inclusive manner and they want to cooperate cooperate with oecd and gpa gpa so wh- on what issues they are going to discuss on they are going to discuss discuss on governance intellectual property rights copyrights they want transparency in artificial intelligence and they want to uh, keep artificial intelligence free free from information manipulation disinformation and they want to use ai for responsible utilization so this will conclude by december 2023 so why is this process notable because uh, see this shows uh, what values and norms will guide uh, artificial intelligence and uh, where it will derive its guiding principles from so this uh, process tells that ai development will have to be aligned with values such as freedom democracy and human rights so they are stressing on fairness accountability transparency and safety so this is why this process is very notable so f- see this is very impo- important so the process entails what democracy human rights and talks about multi stakeholder international organizations so rather than having a single state centric perspective it is going to have a multi hold multi stakeholder in- international organizations are going to be part of it so if multiple stakeholders are there what will happen it it will it will be fair and transparent so so this is important because uh, hap you know what is going to see when it comes to artificial intelligence there is divergence among g7 country so hap will uh, will do some uh, convergence in it because uh, there ne- there need to be consensus among some key regulatory issues see you are going to have disagreements that is fine but uh, on few key, key regulatory issues there, sh- there shouldn't be disagreements so what they are telling for now there are going to be three ways in which the hap can move forward so first thing is it will enable the g7 countries to uh, you know they can have divergent uh, regulations uh, but they can have shared norms principles and guiding values or they can just be overwhelmed by divergence divergent views among uh, g7 countries and not have any meaningful solutions at all and then what they can do uh, they can deliver a mixed outcome with uh, convergence on certain issues and at the same time lack of common ground on others so there are other examples on how the process can help so things like how uh, chat gp chat gpt uh, you know copyright things all this how they are going to work these are all issues so so but how this uh, ipr is going to work in ai that is not uh, sure so there are several conflicting interpre- interpretations and judicial pronouncements on it so but uh, what hap can do is they can help g7 countries move towards a consensus so this process can bring greater clarity on the role of fair use fair use so what is fair use fair use means exception 
invoked when uh, certain copyrighted materials are used for teaching, research and criticism. So, whether this copyrighted material can be used in data sets for machine learning or not, this is a very controversial issue. So, this is also going on. So, finally, what is the vision? So, the common vision is trustworthy artificial intelligence. This is what they want. So, uh, this is what uh, they are telling. So, they are telling uh, uh, even though OECD and uh, HIP are having problems, it has to respond to the concerns of other con country groups because uh, uh, HIP should have international technical standards, right? So, and uh, it is also possible that countries that are not part of uh, G7 would also want to be a part of global governance of uh, AA. So, all these things should be taken into account. So, finally, what do we know about uh, this H HIP has come into picture? So, what do we get to learn from it that uh, AA governance has become a truly global issue and in the future it will only be contested more. So, let us go on to previous year uh, questions. So, songs from prison, who wrote? It was written by Gandhi. 8th August 1942, which of this uh, took place? Quit India resolution was adopted by All India Congress Committee. So, Shah Namaz Khan, Prem Kumar Segal, Gurbak Singh Dilon, who are these people? They are officers of the Indian National Army. Uh, which of the following Asian town is well known for its elaborate system of water harvesting management by building a series of dams and channelizing water into connected reservoirs? It is Dolavira. So, that is all for the day. If you liked it, you can uh, uh, share our channel, comment and subscribe. You can also follow us on YouTube, Instagram, uh, Telegram and Facebook. Thanks for tuning in. I will see you again tomorrow.